Hey everybody, it's Spice Man again from Virtual Airwing 11. Well, in this video, we're going to hop back into the front seat and we're going to walk through the systems in the front seat and then we'll start the Tomcat from a cold start. Should be fun. Let's get started. Let me start off by introducing myself. I was a um, avionics technician in the Navy on the Tomcat for nine years. I was in the Navy for ten and a half. Um, I was in VF-41 from 1986 to 1990. Uh, we had the F-14A. I was in VF-101, the RAG, from 1990 to 1993. We had A's and um, A pluses at the time I was in there. Um, so interestingly, uh, the airplane that um, Heepler has modeled here um, is what we would have called an F-14A+. I, I know that in the official annals of the Navy, there was no such thing as an A+, plus, but there's in, in, the, in the real world, in the fleet, there were certainly were things we called an A+. Plus. Um, you know, these Tomcats were in various stages of avionics upgrades. They didn't upgrade everything all at one time. Um, some upgrades were done in the field. Some upgrades they went to um, the Northrop Grumman Depot in Bethpage for. Um, some they went to the um, depot in um, Norfolk for. I mean, there was all kinds of different stages of upgrades on these things. Um, and uh, But to us in the field, at least uh, in my squadron in my neighborhood uh, it was all around the engines and the TID really what we called the airplane so uh, if we want if the airplane had the new engines and had the old um, TID uh, we would have called that an A plus uh, if it had the engines and the new TID the PTID programmable TID we would have called that a B and that was kind of our the way it worked in our simple minds, you know, at the time. So uh, what we're sitting in right now in the field, we would have actually called an F-14A+, but um, that's neither here nor there. But so we had those, uh, and when I was in VF-101 between 1990 and 93, um, and then I went back to VF-41 from 1993 to 1995, um, still had the F-14 A's there. So I worked on the A's and the A pluses. Um, so like I said, I was an avionics tech, but also during that, in my time, um, I kind of had a couple jack of all trades type jobs. I did uh, some quite a bit of time in troubleshooters. Troubleshooters is the, is the shop that handles all of the servicing and um, they also do the final checking on the catapult. You know, the guys in the on the flight deck with the uh, white jerseys and float coats from the squadron. Those are the um, troubleshooters, final checkers. Also, QA wears white. But um, yeah, so troubleshoot troubleshooters would meet the plane, you know, on the catapult and uh, do the final check, and then um, position themselves, you know, back in the back by the afterburners you know, by the engines back there and give the thumbs up after the wipeout and, and whatnot. Um, so I, I did that for a while, um, learned a lot in there. Cause the other thing that troubleshooters do is they sign off on the daily and turnaround inspections. Every time an airplane comes back, um, there's a turnaround inspection done on it. At the end of every day, there's a daily inspection done on it. And the troubleshooters have to resolve and discrepancies from there and uh, sign off on those inspections. Um, they also do things like pull the oil samples, bleed the hydraulics, um, change tires and brakes, do that, all that routine servicing. So I learned a lot um, through there and then also spent time in QA or quality assurance. Um, quality assurance in a squadron does several things. They do audits. They audit the shops for their, you know, their tool control program, their training program and, you know, various things like that. Um, but then QA's other responsibility is to perform inspections after maintenance on any a safety of flight type things, such as um, you know any any maintenance done on the flight control system, um, 
QA has to sign off on. Anytime you open a panel with flight controls in it, QA has to inspect that panel before it's closed. Uh, they do other simple things like uh, witnessing the torque on the engine bolts if you have to change an engine. Um, they have to. We had to witness the things like the drop checks. You know, as part of a 210 day inspection on the Tomcat, they had to jack it up and cycle the landing gear and blow the landing gear down. And uh, QA had to had to witness that. Um, so that was another kind of jack of all trades job where I learned quite a bit. I wouldn't call myself a front seat subject matter expert, but uh, I, I learned uh, a little bit about it. Um, in Air Wing 11, our subject matter experts really in the front seat of the, are the AEs, the electricians. Uh, we have Hawkeye and we have Vapor who were um, electricians. Uh, Hawkeye was turn qualified. He was uh, qualified to start the jet, you know, for maintenance um, reasons and all that. <clears throat> so those are guys are much more subject matter experts than I am, but uh, but I like making the videos, so uh, you're stuck with me um, for this one. But uh, yeah, so that's me. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Let me come down here and turn the lights test on so we can see the lights. And then I'll position my head over here and freeze it. And we'll go start going through the left-hand console. Um, let me turn tack in on and the radio on. Um, so we'll start in the back. So UG valve um, works on centrifugal force. You're pulling G's. It opens and lets air into the into the G-suit. You can test your G-suit by um, pushing on the top of it. It'll open the valve and inflate your G-suit. So that's the G-valve. Then we have the oxygen valve. Um, back here it turns on oxygen flow to the mask. Uh, the Tomcat A and B held 20 liters of liquid oxygen, two 10-liter bottles. So this turns on oxygen flow. This is a vent airflow regulator. The seat vent uh, or the seat cushions were vented. It pushed air through them. So uh, you could adjust that airflow through the vent airflow. Um, we'll head outboard here. Volume control panel controls the volume for the ALR67, the sidewinder, the labels worn off here, but this is the volume control for the back seat radio and the front seat headset. Here we have the TACAN command push button. So the uh, the airplane only had one TACAN system, one TACAN RT, but it had a control box in each seat. So you could uh, push and pull the um, TACAN command between the front and the back seat uh, with this uh, button here. Um, this is the TACAN control box. I think we're all mostly familiar with TACAN operation. Uh, the outside drum is your tens digit. The inside drum is your um, ones digit. Uh, this is your mode X and Y. This is uh, inverse and normal modes that were never implemented in TACAN in the in the real world. Uh, I think it was a, a something that they were, had intended to give you more channels, so you'd have an X inverse and normal and a Y inverse and normal, but that was never implemented. So uh, that has no function. Um, this is the volume control for your um, station ident. This is your main knob. You've got off, you've got receive only. Um, you've got transmit receive and air to air. This is a beacon mode in TACAN. That was another thing that was never implemented in the real world. So uh, the beacon position there has no function. And this is a bit button. You can run a bit on the TACAN. Uh, if you press it and then release it, um, I think it takes about 20 seconds. But what happens in that time is that the BDHI, the TACAN needle in the BDHI, um, drives to 4 degrees. The DME window on the BDHI will show two nautical miles. <clears throat> and if you have TACAN selected on the HSD, it'll, it'll show the same thing. But then after about 20 seconds, the system will run bit, and then uh, you'll get a go light if it passes, a no-go if it fails. So that's the TACAN. Um, we'll jump back outboard here to the ICS control box. Um, 
There's two amplifiers in the ICS control box, a normal amplifier and a backup amplifier. Um, if both of those fail, you can go to emergency. And what emergency does is it uses the backup amplifier in the other seat's ICS control box. Kind of gives you a third amplifier there. So that's emergency. And the volume knob, um, the hot mic, cold mic, and then has a radio override position. What that position does is it um, attenuates all non-ICS audio. And there's that. And jump back over here to the front seat UHF, basic UHF radio um, operation, mode switch, off main turns on the main receiver, both turns on the main and the guard receiver. That's normally the mode you operate in just so you'll get anybody transmitting on, on guard um, without having to change anything. Here we have an ADF uh, position here that had no function in the real world. The airplane only has one ADF system, uh, the ARA-48 direction finder, and that's tied to the rear seat radio. It's not tied to the front seat radio. So um, the ADF position here in the front seat has no function. Um, preset channel selector. Uh, this is your mode for being in the preset or in manual. You tune it with the uh, toggle switches here. Um, guard fixes it to the guard frequency. Um, this is a tone switch. What a tone switch would do is uh, just broadcast a continuous, I think it was 1,020 hertz tone. Um, so if anyone else was trying to get an ADF bearing on you, you could hit that tone switch there and just broadcast a continuous tone. Uh, this is a load switch for loading the presets. Uh, this is a brightness knob. Full bright goes into test. Um, this is a volume knob. Uh, squelch on and off. This is a read, so if you're in preset and you want to read what frequency you're looking at, you can hit the uh, hit the read switch there. So that's the front seat radio. Let's hop back outboard here to the STABOG or the a AFCS Automatic Flight Control System. Three switches to engage pitch, roll, and yaw SAS or stability augmentation. Um, Normally, that's always engaged. You turn the roll sass off for as part of the combat checklist is to turn the roll sass off um, in the Tomcat. But normally, you just kind of run with those engaged. Um, after that, you have the autopilot. Um, here is just your basic autopilot engage. Um, engaging the autopilot uh, in the Tomcat engages attitude hold, um, just the basic function of the autopilot. Um, but in the Tomcat, they actually implemented a cool twist on attitude hold. It's called control stick steering. So you engage the autopilot, it engages attitude hold, but you can change your attitude. If you use the control stick to change um, your pitch or your, or your bank um, and then uh, let go, it'll hold that new pitch or bank. Um, so that's a really cool uh, mode of the autopilot that they incorporated into the Tomcat. These other modes are engaged by one of two means. Um, if you want to engage heading hold, you simply flip it to heading hold. Um, and then if your bank angle is less than plus or minus five degrees, it'll engage heading hold. But uh, uh, if you want to engage ground track, for example, though, you flip the switch and it's just arming that mode. And on the VDI, there's a set of uh, a bank of lights on the left side of the VDI up there. Um, one of those lights is AP reference or autopilot reference. So flipping the switch just arms that mode. And if you actually want to engage it, uh, you uh, click the uh, nose wheel steering engage switch on the, on the control stick. And then the AP reference light will go out. And then you've actually engaged that mode of the autopilot. So that's how uh, ground track is engaged. And altitude hold is engaged the same way. Um, you flip the switch, you get the AP reference light, and then you can click on the nose wheel steering button um, to actually engage the mode. It will disengage itself with control stick forces. Um, it doesn't require much to disengage altitude hold. I think it's a pound or two on the control stick. And then if it disengages, the autopilot reference light will come back on. And if you want to re-engage it, you need to hit the uh, this um, nose wheel steering switch again. But so that's altitude hold. 
outboard of this, we have uh, Vector PCD. That is a mode that where you're steered by data link from a data link host such as the E2 or the E3. Um, if you don't have it engaged and they're sending you steering information on the VDI, you get a commanded altitude bug, you get a commanded heading bug, you can steer yourself or uh, you can actually be steered over the data link by uh, the E2 or the E3 by engaging uh, vector PCD and you get the autopilot reference light and you click the nose wheel steering button. It's got two modes, vector and PCD. Vector steering is you're just being steered in, in bank uh, PCD or precision course directed steering, direction steering, you're being steered in both pitch and bank um, by the by the host there. I don't think that's implemented um, in the in the sim. Maybe someday we get a full, you know, E2 or E3 module in the sim uh, that'll work in the sim, but that's not implemented in, in the sim. I, I don't even know if I've really used that much in in real life. I never really heard about it much, but yeah, yeah, that's that mode. Um, the other one here is ACL. So this is the mode that you would engage for an ACLS mode one or mode one A landing. Um, typically you arm it and then uh, you'll enter that ACLS acquisition gate there about six nautical miles out. The uh, spin 42 will um, offer, <clears throat> you know, to couple with you. You'll get the command control light come on. Uh, on the left of the VDI there, and then you can go to ACL. You'll get to uh, autopilot reference light will come on. You engage it uh, via the uh, nose wheel steering button on the stick, and then now you're coupled um, to the spin 42, and the uh, the boat is steering you via data link um, for the ACLS landing. Uh, one thing on those um, data link, you know, steering modes of the autopilot is when you engage those, you really need to be um, kind of on course and straight and level um, because there is a uh, mechanical link between the data link and the uh, uh, autopilot and the, and the flight control system. It's called a pitch parallel actuator. And that is connected uh, to the flight control um, system through a, a link called a force link. And it's meant to kind of separate or kind of shear itself off if, um, too much force is applied um, to the flight control system from that from that actuator. So if you're not straight and level and on course when you actuate that, and it has to apply too it applies too much force to the flight control system, it'll break that link, and then you won't be able to couple. Uh, and that link can only be reset by maintenance. So that that airplane won't be able to fly a coupled approach until that force link is is reset. Um, so that's a little bit on that. Uh, I think that uh, covers that. Let me reposition here and get you a better view. And we'll talk about some of the systems up here. This is your engine mode select panel. Um, the engine is controlled by the main engine control. and But there's also a system called the AFTC of the Augmenter Fan Temperature Controller which is the primary mode. The AFTC is basically the electronic sort of brain of the engine. The main engine control uh, just by itself is uh, much more of a hydromechanical type mode of engine control. And there are some limitations when the AFTC is not online. Um, the uh, afterburner is inhibited. Um, I think the nozzles are forced closed. Uh, the guide vanes in the front of the engine are kind of forced open. So, th I mean, there are some limitations when you're um, operating in the in the secondary mode. Um, <clears throat> when you're in secondary mode, uh, the uh, secondary engine secondary light will light up on the caution advisory panel to tell you that the engine has switched to secondary mode. But uh, but that's what this um, is. And then outboard of here, we have the uh, asymmetric thrust limiter. That's a system that um, prevents asymmetric thrust by um, the first engine to hit afterburner. It will hold that engine there until the second engine hits afterburner. Sort of how that works. Um, but you can disable that through this guarded switch here. Um, disable the asymmetric thrust limiter. But that's what that is. 
forward of here, we have the um, air start. This forces the engine ignition on. So um, the Tomcat's engine ignition is not unlike a car uh, engine ignition. You have, um, you know, on each engine, you have an engine-driven alternator. Generates a low voltage. I think it's 5 volts AC. Um, that's generated by that alternator. Uh, then it goes through a transformer that can be grounded or not uh, to turn the ignition on or off, and then and then it goes to uh, um, an exciter that you know jacks that up to 25,000 volts or so uh, for the spark igniters in the combustion chamber. Um, now that system is normally um, engaged when the uh, throttle is out of cutoff and um, on the idle stops. Uh, I think it uh, turns on when the RPM hits 10% uh, and turns off when the RPM hits 59%. And then I think it's also um, engaged if there's a 5% per second uh, deceleration um, of the engine RPM. I think that turns on the engine ignition. So it's controlled um, automatically. Uh, in large extent, but uh, for if you have to do an air start on the engines, uh, this air start control um, forces on that uh, continuous engine ignition. So that's what that switch is for. Uh, and then this is the uh, rudder trim, pretty self-explanatory. Up here we have the uh, throttle mode switch manual boost and auto um, the deep you always you normally run in boost um, so a little bit on, on the throttle so between this throttle quadrant up here and the throttle on the main engine controller there's push pull cables um, it's a very long run of push pull cables um, and in the manual mode uh, you're con you're um, changing the throttle setting on the main engine controller via those cables and only via those cables. Um, it's quite a bit of force to move the throttles in that manual mode. I think it might be up to 15 pounds of force or so. It's quite a bit um, if you're just uh, in manual mode and controlling the throttle through the mechanical linkage there. But the, the mode, you, and that's your kind of your fallback mode, uh, the boost mode is what you, you um, run in normally. Now, also in this throttle quadrant are some electrical sensors that sense the position of the throttle handles. Um, and that's fed electronically back to a throttle servo actuator on the main engine control. And that's, um, and that's uh, you know, the boost mode. And then that throttle servo actuator is then feeding the throttle position sort of back up to the throttle quadrant through those cables and kind of so there's no pressure sort of on those cables um, in the boost mode because uh, your throttle is really being controlled by the the throttle servo actuator from the from the electrical signal uh, sent by the sensor in the in the throttle quadrant so that's kind of almost like power steering if you will uh, for the throttles a properly rigged throttle system um, you feel very little force on these uh, on these throttle handles uh, in boost throttle mode. So uh, that's kind of how that works. Then you have auto throttle, which will, um, the CADC uh, is using um, total temperature and uh, AOA inputs uh, through the throttle computer, the approach power compensator, uh, to adjust the throttles to um, maintain a constant AOA. Um, so that's auto throttles. You would use that on, on landing um, if desired. Uh, and then, but out here is a throttle temperature setting. You know, one of the things that determines how much throttle the CADC is going or the approach power compensator is going to, is going to, you know, provide to hold that AOA is, is, um, you know, air temperature is a big input to that. You know, on a hot day, less dense air, uh, you're going to need more throttle to maintain that AOA, a bigger throttle adjustment. On a cold day with less dense air, you're going to need less of a throttle adjustment to maintain that AOA. And that's what this temperature is for. It sets a gain schedule in that approach power compensator uh, to change, vary the gain based on outside air temperature. Uh, and that's what this is. I can't remember what, you know, 
degree day you're supposed to run hot normal and cold but um, but that's what that's for um, outside here we have the engine crank switch that engages the uh, the starter runs off compressed air 45 psi of compressed air from an external air source um, engine crank left or right it's, mag it's magnetically held it'll release itself when the engine rpm reaches 50 percent but that's your engine crank switch and then here you have uh, the inlet ramps stow and auto and auto the inlet ramps are being controlled it's a system called AICS air inlet control system uh, they're being controlled by the CADC the central air data computer um, and uh, you know it's based on uh, air temperature um, altitude whatnot uh, automatically controls the position of those inlet ramps but you can force them to stow here um, on these switches if there's an issue um, so that's what those are for um, way outboard here you can't even see it it's nestled way outboard here is the target designator switch it does couple functions based on what mode you're in if you're in air to air mode on the uh, on the PDCP over there on the right um, that's a uh, that engages the uh, um, dog fight modes from the front seat VSL high and VSL low as engaged through the target designator switch those are kind of akin to um, the vertical acquisition mode if you're um, if you've flown the Hornet before uh, so that's that's VSL vertical scan lock on the antenna will scan vertically and um, lock on the first thing it sees and within five nautical miles um, and then the other one there is um, PAL or pilot automatic lock on you, know, you push the switch forward it's PAL um, and that uh, is a 10 degree 8 bar sweep of the uh, AUG9 antenna and it will lock on to the first thing it sees within 15 nautical miles so those are two um, air to air dogfight modes and then if you're in air to ground mode this is a target designator switch if you're in computer um, target or computer IP the um, there's a diamond a desert target designator diamond on the HUD that you slew up and down the bomb fall line with the uh, target designator switch um, and then when it's overlaying the ground target that you want to drop the bomb on or in computer IP if it's overlaying the uh, IP um, then you push it forward to designate that and then it becomes ground stabilized the computer target it becomes ground stabilized and computer IP the diamond will then shift to the um, to the IP offset that the Rio has programmed uh, into the uh, system through the computer address panel that's what computer IP is for it's an offset bombing technique it's when um, uh, you know you know what the IP is. let's say the IP is a dam right and but <clears throat> the target is offset from that is three three zero degrees ten nautical miles from that dam uh, what you would do is uh, the pilot would put that diamond over the dam and he would designate that as the IP and then the diamond would then switch to that uh, offset that three three zero ten nautical miles the diamond would jump to there um, and then that's the point that you're gonna bomb um, when you release the bomb uh, or hold the pickle when the computer releases the bomb um, but that's what that is for in air to ground mode so that's your target designator outboard there um, so that's that so now let's talk about the throttle quadrant over here you got your flap handle uh, flap handle has detented positions of up and down <clears throat> pretty basic flap operation now it also has an emergency up and emergency down uh, it's not implemented in the sim but you'd push it outboard and then you could push it up into emergency up and that sort of bypasses the um, you know the electromechanical control of the flaps and uh, forces flap retraction emergency down was actually never implemented in the Tomcat um, so you, you do not have an emergency down capability even though the handle um, you know will go there but you only have an emergency up uh, but that's the that's the flap handle and then we have uh, your throttle controls talked a little bit about that 
Um, uh, the throttle control you kind of push, it's not really graphically shown, you know, in the sim, but uh, you have idle cutoff. Um, to get it from idle cutoff to idle, you push it outboard. It's called going around the horn. Um, and then you can bring it up into idle and then forward into max thrust or military power. And then to go to afterburner, you had to push it outboard again. Um, and then it would go up into afterburner. Um, so that's the throttle. Now there are various interlocks that the throttle um, controls kind of hit along the way. Um, uh, if it was in idle cutoff, um, the uh, bleed air uh, valves are shut off, I believe, and um, the ignition is armed, but it's not, you know, um, enabled. And then you kind of bring it into idle. And as long as you're against those idle stops, um, uh, that's another set of interlocks. If you're against the idle stop interlock, um, the spoiler brakes are enabled. Um, the pop open nozzles um, are enabled. The, the nozzles will pop open on the deck. And uh, nose wheel uh, steering center line is enabled. Um, if the hook is down and the throttle is at idle, the nose wheel steering is centered. Uh, I think one of the main reasons for that is like when, you know, when the wire is pulling you back um, on the boat, you want that nose wheel steering centered. The nose wheel steering will also automatically um, center itself when you raise the, uh, the, um, the landing gear lever. But, uh, yeah, but so being against the idle stop enables those interlocks. Uh, if you want to cross bleed start, there's an interlock that's enabled when you come off of the um, idle stop. So you need to be off of the idle stop if you're going to do a um, uh, a cross bleed start. Um, and then uh, there's the mill stop. There's another interlock in here below 85% is for the wheels light. Uh, if the landing gear is not down and locked, and the and then if, and if the flaps are down. And if you go below 85% power, there's an interlock there, and that will light the uh, the wheels warning light up on the ladder light to the left of the HUD there. So that's another interlock. Um, there's a set of interlocks when you're against the uh, the mill power stop. Uh, the speed brakes will be retracted. DLC uh, direct lift control will be disengaged when you're against the mill stop, and also the launch bar light will extinguish. So when you first go into Neil. There's a launch bar um, <clears throat> light that comes on the caution advisory panel. Um, if uh, the, both throttles are against the idle or the, the military power stop there, it will extinguish that um, launch bar light. So, uh, so that's a little bit about the interlocks um, on the throttle. Uh, talked about kind of general operation. Um, up here you have um, some hat switches. You have your your microphone hat switch there to key the, uh, it's got four positions. You can key the uh, UHF-1, UHF-2, ICS, or both radios um, from this hat switch. This is your speed brakes to extend or retract the speed brakes. Um, and then this is your wing sweep hat switch. It's got four positions. It's got forward, aft, uh, which are momentary, and then it's got bomb and um, auto, which are detended positions on that hat switch. Um, and that kind of goes along with the emergency wing sweep handle. So a little bit about um, the emergency wing sweep handle and the, and the wing sweep system. So the emergency wing sweep handle is used for a couple things. Um, one of its uses is to get the wings in and out of oversweep. Uh, so let's say that, um, you know, you're on the, you're on the deck, you land, um, um, or the wings aren't back in oversweep, they're at 68 and you want to get the wings into oversweep. So what you do is you, uh, you raise that handle. Uh, it right, raises up and down. Um, and when you raise that handle to get it into oversweep, there's a couple things that happen. Um, number one is it lets the air out of the airbags. If you look on the back of the plane after the wings, there you have airbags back there. Um, they're inflated by bleed air uh, from the engines, and uh, they inflate when the wings are back to provide some structural rigidity, I think, back there. I think it's one of their main purposes, and kind of fill that gap between the fuselage 
and the wings. And for the wings to go back into oversweep, that bag needs to be deflated. So when you raise that handle, you're deflate, you're letting the air out of the airbags there. And then the other thing it does is it engages a limiter for the horizontal stab movement. Um, and there's a light that will light on the caution advisory panel when you raise that handle. It's called horizontal tail authority. And you wait for that light to go out. <clears throat> so when you put the wings in oversweep, you've got to be a little bit patient. A lot of guys try and rush it and they think something is wrong or it's a bug or, or whatever, but it's not. You just have to raise the handle and then wait for that, that horizontal tail authority light will come on. Then you have to wait for that to go off. And it takes about 10 seconds or so for that light to go off um, and then uh, when it does then you can go ahead and left click and drag it um, back into into oversweep so that's kind of how that works for getting the wings in and out of oversweep uh, now whenever you transition the wings in or out of oversweep you want to hit the master uh, reset button um, just keep that in mind as well it resets the uh, the CADC there um, now, the other thing the emergency wing sweep handle does is emergency wing sweep. <laughs> um, so, kind of the wing sweep system, kind of how it works is there's electrical, you know, wing sweep servo that, um, you know, drives the wings normally. Um, you can drive it through the uh, hat switch here going forward and aft, or if you're in auto, you know, the CADC is um, driving that wing sweep servo and under here you can't see it but there's a there's a mechanism called a spider detent um, and it matches the, the electrical position of that um, wing sweep servo uh, just picture a gear type type mechanism with a with a sort of a notch in it if you will and this wing sweep handle when it's down when it's and when it's all the way down it sits in that notch of that spider detent. And so when you drive the wings forward and aft, you'll see the uh, the handle moving forward and aft as it's resting in that spider detent and um, the electrical, you know, wing sweep servo is, is driving forward and aft. Um, but you can override that um, by you pop the handle up. And it actually pops up kind of two discrete distances. It's not, this isn't model either, but uh, you can pop it up an inch, and then you can pop it up two inches. If you pop it up an inch, uh, there is a series of notches here that the wing sweep handle will rest in. They're like in four degree increments there. So you can pop it up more than an inch and then grab it and wrestle it out of that spider detent. It actually takes quite a bit of force. I think it's 30 pounds of force is required to wrestle um, or pull the uh, emergency wing sweep handle out of that spider detent. Uh, but once it's out of the spider detent, uh, it can it can go down. It won't go down all the way if it's not in the spider detent. But it will go down and sort of uh, sit in the in one of those notches that's along here in those four degree increments. Um, and now and now the pilot is responsible uh, for not exceeding the wing sweep. You know. Uh, limitations. You've taken control from the system, and so as a pilot, it's on you now uh, to pull those wings back as your airspeed increases, so as not to um, exceed the structural, you know, limitations um, of the airplane. The the natops, the pocket natops, has a schedule there for how far, you know, the wings can be based on. Uh, you know, your indicated Mach number, but you know, you've sort of taken responsibility from that if you wrestle the uh, wing sweep uh, out of that spider detent there. But, um, but you know, that that's sort of how that uh, wing sweep handle works. Um, now, uh, if you want to engage it back into the spider detent, I think it can only engage back into the spider detent at 20 and 68 degrees. Um, and that's when the wings can be put back into auto mode. And I think that's on purpose because you don't want the wings inadvertently um, in auto mode if they're not, you know, all the way back. Um, you know, the worst thing that can happen is, uh, you know, you inadvertently hit auto mode and the wings are driven out there with an airplane, you know, next to you. So, you know, it's to sort of kind of prevent that the wing sweep handle will only sit in that spider detent um, 
or when it's at either either 20 um, or 68. And if it's not in that spider detent, it won't go all the way down. And so the the plastic cover actually won't close all the way unless that wing sweep emergency wing sweep handle is uh, fully engaged in that spider detent. Uh, it kind of works as a, a an indication to the pilot that um, uh, you know that wing sweep handle isn't in, engaged. Um, that's one of the things the pilot checks uh, when you first get in the airplane is compare the position of the wings against the emergency wing sweep handle because again one of the worst things you want to happen is for hydraulics to come on and those wings to sweep you know uncommanded but um so that's a little bit um on how the emergency wing sweep handle works um so while we're on that let's go ahead and look at the uh, uh the wing sweep indicator so it's got a couple of flags it's got off it's got auto manual emergency and oversweep um, to show what mode you're in. Uh, and then it's got three tapes. It has the, the right tape is the actual wing sweep position. Um, the set of captain's bars here is the commanded wing sweep position. And then this triangle looking indicator over here on the, on the left is the, is the, um, the CADC commanded wing sweep position. Uh, so as you, uh, you know, if you have the wings in auto, this triangle is where the CADC is telling the wings to be. And as you go faster, you'll see it kind of move down and and sweep aft. Um, and if you're in auto, you know, the captain's bars will be matching um, up with that triangle. And then the wings will sweep, you know, to match the captain's bars and the triangle will all be kind of lined up. Um, now, the triangle also indicates the forwardmost position of the wings. You know, the system is not going to let you sweep the wings um, farther forward than this triangle. So if you just hold that, um, you know, that wing sweep hat switch into forward, this will drive up. But when it hits, uh, you know, where this triangle is, the wings will revert to auto because uh, it's just not going to let you. And that's, you know, a safety thing to prevent, you know, damage, structural damage, um, you know, to the airplane. But that's kind of how that works. Um, yeah, so those are your three tapes there. Um, the manual flag will be on if you bump that hat switch, you know, forward or aft, and um, kind of you're bringing it out of auto. Uh, there's emergency here, so if you wrestle that emergency wing sweep handle out of that spider detent, raise that handle, uh, the emergency wing sweep flag will come on. And then when they're back in oversweep, the oversweep flag will come on. So uh, that's how that works. And that rounds out uh, um, our left-hand console there. I've got my head repositioned here. And let's uh, go through the left uh, vertical console. Start at the bottom. You have master reset. Master reset resets all the faults in the caution advisory um, system, you know, all the, all the systems that uh, uh, are tied to that, you know, have a reset input you know, to them. And this uh, master reset will reset those faults. If it's a transient fault, it'll stay gone. If it's a real fault, you know, it'll it'll come back. Um, but that's what master reset is for. Uh, one of the most common times you hit it normally is uh, for when you go in and out of oversleep, like I mentioned before. <clears throat> uh, during startup, um, when you do the emergency generator check, there's often faults that will um, appear as a result of that power, power transient there and you hit master reset there but uh, but that's you know what that is um, inboard of that we have anti-skid spoiler brake so the spoiler brakes um, you know it'll raise the spoilers if you have that engaged whenever the throttles against that idle stop there it will raise the uh, the spoilers uh, the other position is for both to engage uh, anti-skid as well as the spoiler brake. So anti-skid, as the name implies, keeps the uh, the wheels from <clears throat> locking up or coming to a complete stop. It's uh, if you turn anti-skid on, it's armed. Um, it doesn't engage itself until the wheels have spun up. Uh, and in fact, all braking is inhibited uh, once you get weight on wheels until the wheels have spun up to a certain point. I don't know how what that point is, but um, you know you can't land in the Tomcat with the brake pedal held and pop the tires because um, braking just doesn't isn't uh, enabled until the wheels have um, spun up 
and then uh, anti-skid will enable itself as well. Uh, and then anti-skid will disable itself when you get down to 15 knots. Anti-skid will disable, you know, for taxing. And then when you're taxing, uh, you're supposed to turn the anti-skid off because what you don't want to happen is, um, you know, you're taxing along at 5, 10 miles an hour, and then you, you goose the throttle, um, and then uh, anti-skid is going to enable itself uh, when you get above a certain point. And then it's a few seconds uh, while that anti-skid system is arming itself where you don't have um, any braking um, authority, right? And so the worst thing you want to happen is you goose the throttle and now an anti-skid is on um, and you wind up slamming it into the plane in front of you, right? So um, when, after you turn off the runway, you're supposed to turn anti-skid off. Um, so uh, that's the anti-skid. And on startup, we'll run a bit test um, the bit test is uh, you release the parking brake, you uh, hold the the, uh, the brake pedals, and then the plane captain or his helper will go up in the nose wheel well, and up in there is a bit box up there, and he presses a button, and after 10 seconds, the uh, the pilot will feel the brakes release um, as part of a good bit test. Um, but, uh, but that's a little bit on the anti-skid. Uh, above here, we have some fuel system controls. You have the dump. Uh, fuel dump there, um, turn that on, it enables fuel dump. You can't dump if you're on with weight on wheels, and you can't dump with the uh, speed brakes extended. Um, but that's the fuel dump. This is your refueling probe, uh, has retract, and then extend fuselage and extend all. Extend fuselage will just uh, refuel the fuselage, and extend all will ref refill the fuselage as well as the wings and the tanks. Uh, and then over here you have the fuel quantity um, selector rocker switch. Um, let me reposition my head a little bit and we'll talk about the, the fuel system um, in the Tomcat. So here's the main fuel quantity gauge over here. And you'll notice uh, two tapes, uh, forward and left, and then, um, I'm sorry, aft and left and forward and right. Um, so the fuel system is kind of divided into, into two halves in the Tomcat. Uh, the aft consists of the aft fuselage cells. Um, uh, the fuselage has in it a uh, bunch of fuel cells. Uh, they are forward fuel cells. These are bladders, um, uh, bladder type cells. The forward um, bladders are um, cells one and two. And then the aft bladders are cells five, six, seven, and eight. So that's the fuel in the fuselage. Um, and then there's also a, a vent tank back there um, for kind of overflow. That vent tank isn't isn't metered, so it's not um, part of the fuel quantity system. But um, now the aft uh, aft and um, left is also contains the feed group and it says left that's the feed group the feed group consists of the uh the feed tanks which are integral tanks built into the box beam the box beam is that main aircraft structure there that um you know everything is kind of bolted to the landing gear is bolted to it the wings are um bolted to it uh, if you've ever seen a Tomcat documentary, it, it is that revolutionary, you know, vacuum welded titanium um, structure that the Tomcat is really built around. But it's got some integral fuel tanks into it. Tanks uh, three and four are the uh, left and right um, feed tanks. And then you have the uh, left and right sump tanks. Those are also part of the feed group. So these tapes are the quantities of the fuselage. Um, uh, fuel cells and the uh, the left and right feed groups, um, and then uh, these windows over here indicate the quantity based on the rocker switch of either the quantity in the feed group, uh, or the quantity in the external tanks, or the quantity in the wing tanks. That's what these windows here um, will indicate. Uh, fuel is moved around the Tomcat through a couple different mechanisms. One is called mode of flow. 
Motive flow is a method of pumping fuel that doesn't require power and it doesn't require any moving parts. It's based on the Venturi principle, kind of like the carburetor in a car. Um, you know, motive flow is high pressure fuel that's pumped through these Venturi type pumps. Um, and that high pressure fuel through the Venturi action draws the low pressure or the static fuel in that tank, um, you know, out of that tank. So that's motive flow. Uh, there's interconnects between um, tanks that kind of uh, move fuel around. It kind of keeps things level. There's interconnects between the, the fuselage cells. Uh, there's an interconnect between the sump tanks that may or may not be open. It opens, um, I believe, if cells... Cell 2 is the, uh, is the main uh, cell in the aft, or in, rather in the forward group, and uh, cell 5 is the main fuselage cell in the... Uh, in the aft group, you know, the other cells kind of empty into that. And then um, cells two and five have a connection into the uh, into the sump tanks. Um, but the fuselage cells have an interconnect between them that kind of keeps them level between them. And then there's also an interconnect between the sump tanks um, that's closed to keep the left and the right um, system separate. But then it opens whenever cells two and five um, show empty, uh, read empty, that in, opens that interconnect between um, the sump tanks. So when you get down to a certain um, fuel level, it's not a left and right system anymore. It's actually one sort of combined system because the interconnect between those um, sump tanks open. Um, so that's one way of moving fuel around. The other way is through air. Um, the external tanks, uh, fuel is actually pushed out of the external tanks using um, ECS air is pumped into the tanks and it pushes the fuel out of the external tanks. Um, so that's another way of moving fuel around. And then there's good old mother nature physics, <laughs> a way of, um, of um, changing the fuel flow in the airplane. Uh, the feed tanks are normally, are not vented. Uh, there's vents to the feed tanks um, but uh, there, there's a valve there that's normally closed and the feed tanks aren't vented. And what that does is, you know, at certain power settings, you know, that those feed tanks are gravity fed into the sump tanks. And if the engines are, you know, drawing up to a certain mount, uh, you're within the, the diameter of, the, of that gravity feed and those non-vented uh, feed tanks and you're, and you're getting your fuel from the sump via those, those feed tanks. But above a certain power level, you're trying to draw more out of that gravity feed than it can provide because those feed tanks aren't vented. And then what that will do is it'll flip open some interconnect valves between the sump tanks and the fuselage tanks, two and five. And then it'll start drawing fuel from those fuselage tanks um, because the, the lack of pressure from the feed tanks will flip those valves open. So... That's a little, you know, sort of good old Mother Nature uh, way of um, of drawing fuel from different places. And then once you get uh, below a certain point, when those sump, when that interconnect between the sump tanks open, as I mentioned, the uh, the valves will open and open up the vent into the feed tanks as well, just to get the last bit of fuel um, out of the airplane as a combined left and right system. So that's how. Uh, you know, some of that works. Um, but back to the, uh, the console here, we have a wing external transfer switch here. Now normally, um, fuel is not drawn from the wings and the external tanks with weight on wheels. And I think one of the main reasons for that is you want those um, to be full to minimize the uh, structural load from sloshing you know, on the cat launch. Um, so normally with weight on wheels and with the switch in auto, you're not um, drawing fuel from the wings in the tanks. Uh, you can uh, put that in override and then even with weight on wheels you're drawing fuel from the wings in the tanks. Uh, and then if you go to off you're inhibiting fuel flow from the wings in the tanks even with uh, weight off wheels if you have it in off. Now it'll automatically, um, it's magnetically held in off and it'll automatically switch to auto under certain conditions. Uh, I think a couple of them are if you put the 
fuel probe and to extend all. I think that switch will flip to auto. And then um, when your feed group gets below a certain point or your cells two and five um, are dry, uh, I think one of those two things or both, um, that will release that switch from off and it'll go back uh, to auto. But that's what um, that switch is for. And then over here you have a guarded switch, this feed switch. Um, as I said, under normal conditions, your left and your right um, systems are, are separate. Um, but you can override that with this switch here. When this switch is in forward, uh, both engines are drawing fuel um, from the uh, forward uh, and uh, right feed group. And then if you put it in aft, both engines are drawing fuel from the aft um, and the left feed group. Um, so that's what that, I think it also opens the interconnect between the, the sump tanks, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong, but I think that's the case too. But um, but that's what that switch is. And then over to the left here, we have a control position indicator for the horizontal stabs, the rudders, and then the inboard and outboard spoilers. A little bit on the spoiler. So the inboard spoilers are powered by the uh, combined hydraulics system tied to the left engine. The outboard spoilers are driven by a, a electromechanical hydraulic pump. Um, it's called the outboard spoiler mod or the spoiler mod. Um, that is turned on when the wing sweep is forward of a certain degree. I think it's 60 degrees, somewhere thereabout. When the wings sweep forward of that, um, the outboard spoiler mod is turned on to power the outboard spoilers. Um, so and after that, the outboard spoilers are um, disabled. So a little bit about the spoilers, but that's the spoiler position indicator here. Um, and then here we had the parking brake. Uh, so let's talk about the parking brakes here for a minute. And let me reposition my head so you can see the aux brake gauges down here. Uh, let's see. the stick um, all right so the way that the brakes work is you kind of have three braking systems in the in the Tomcat uh, you have the normal brakes uh, which is powered by the combined hydraulic system provides braking um, hydraulic pressure you know from the from the rudder pedals um, and then you have two auxiliary brake systems. those auxiliary brake systems have a, a a nitrogen bottle, an accumulator. I think they're in the, both in the nose wheel well there, and um, uh, those are actually pumped up by the hydraulic hand pump here. Um, these indicators here show the nitrogen pressure in those auxiliary brake bottles. I think the red is up to 1,900 psi, if I'm not mistaken, and then the green is between um, 1,900 and 2,100, if I'm not mistaken, but could be wrong about that. But uh, but yeah, there's a red and a green, um, and those are pumped up. That's one of the plane captain's jobs is to keep that those pumped up. Uh, there's a hydraulic hand pump here um, that uh, I just flipped it. Let me get my head back in a better place here, and you can actually pump that in the sim. But there we go. Um, but that hydraulic hand pump. Uh, has a couple of different purposes. Number one, uh, it's one of the plane captain's jobs when he's in the cockpit to uh, uh, keep those aux brake accumulators pumped up, and that's done through this um, hydraulic hand pump. Uh, and uh, well, the other jobs that hydraulic hand pump can do is number one, uh, if you flip the probe out, you can actually extend that probe um, from the. Wow, it actually works in the sim. I did not realize that. But you can um, pump that. Uh, that's really cool. You, you can pump the refueling probe out through the uh, through the hydraulic hand pump. Uh, that's one of the things they can do. Pump it back in too. Um, and then also it's for the radome. So if the uh, avionics guys need to get under the radome and uh, work on the antenna or what have you, there is a hydraulic valve in the nose wheel well you kind of rotate that and you stick your screwdriver in it to hold it and then you come up to the uh, to the cockpit uh, and you pump that hydraulic cam pump and it actually raises the ray dome um, but back to the brakes yeah so it's the plane captain's job is to keep is one of his tasks is to 
uh, pumped up those uh, aux brake accumulators. But there's two of them. Uh, the parking brake is actually uh, one of your aux brakes. Um, so actually, as you put that uh, parking brake on and off, you'll see the that gauge go down. I guess it's a simulator thing that they show in the red here. It's maybe not implemented, but yeah, you get uh, a handful of activations out of that uh, parking brake. I think every time you uh, engage and release that, you'll see this needle come down. I think it's about 300 PSI to pop. Um, so you only get so many um, activations out of that parking brake, and you got to, plane count's got to pump that up again. Uh, and then you have your um, your auxiliary brakes. So if you lose combined hydraulic pressure to the brakes, well now when you pump the brake pedal there, you're using the aux brakes. Um, and you'll also see the wheels light, uh, I'm sorry, the brakes light come on on the ladder light up there. And then you only, you get like 14 or 15 pumps of those brakes as you pump them. You'll see this one kind of drawing down as well. So um, if uh, pilot is using those aux brakes, combined aux combined hydraulic system, or 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 what have you. Um, Got to be mindful of of that. Uh, but those are your two auxiliary um, braking systems, and the parking brake being one of them. So that's the, but that's the parking brake handle. Uh, the other indication here is the eject command lever. Um, so in the rear seat, there's that eject command lever. Um, it's got two positions, pilot and Rio. I think it's actually labeled NFO. Uh, but the position of that handle determines what happens if the Rio initiates ejection. Um, if the pilot initiates, both seats always go. There's no sense in the pilot ejecting and um, and uh, the Rio not. So uh, the pilot ejects, they always both go. Um, but if the Rio ejects, if that handle is in pilot back there and the Rio ejects, just the Rio will go and the pilot will stay. If that handle is in Rio or NFO back there, um, they'll both go if the Rio ejects. So that's what that's for. Uh, and then we have the no strut actuator here. Uh, you can put the plane in kneel. There's a kneel valve on the top of the no strut um, when you go to kneel, it lets the uh, hydraulic fluid out of the nose strut plane kneels. And that also allows the uh, launch bar um, to um, extend when you kneel the plane. Um, there's a little latch on there um, that you have to pull to extend the launch bar. Um, and then uh, and then you can go to extend. Now if the launch bar, let me reposition myself again. Uh, if you're kneeled and you need to abort the launch, there's a, a launch bar abort um, switch here. Um, it's momentary. You have to hold it up. There's a little actuator on the nose strut that'll pull that launch bar back up. Um, and that's if you like have to abort the, the cat launch. Um, the uh, What will happen is the, um, the yellow shirt will, will give the signal there to abort the launch. Um, you keep the throttle in there, um, but what they'll do is they'll retract the shuttle, and then um, the holdback fitting is still holding you, so you're not going to go anywhere. But they they retract that that shuttle, and then they'll give you this uh, signal to uh, raise the the launch bar, and the pilot will raise the launch bar, and then they'll pull the shuttle forward, um, and then they'll give you the signal you can drop. The launch bar, um, and then they'll give you this sin the signal to kind of throttle back, um, and then uh, they'll um, remove the holdback fitting there, and then um, they can do the entire launch sequence over again. You know, if they want to try again, or if they want to spin you off the cat, they'll just have you um, extend the nose strut, engage nose wheel steering, and they'll tax you off the cat. But uh, but that's the nose nose strut. Um, then you have the landing gear lever. This is a downlock override that prevents you from raising the landing gear level lever if you have weight on wheels. Um, for whatever reason you need to raise the lever with weight on wheels, you can lift this latch and then raise the lever. But the lever has, also has a little tab on it and there's a hydraulic isolation, isolation switch here. Um, when you put the handle up, it releases this switch and it goes into flight. And what that does, it removes hydraulic pressure from the landing gear system with weight off wheels and the, and the landing gear up. 
um, you put the landing gear handle down, this tab hits the switch and it puts it into takeoff and landing and provides hydraulic pressure um, to the landing gear system. I think it also removes it from the nose wheel steering uh, system as well, this, this uh, switch. But, so that, but that's what that is. And then you have emergency extension. For emergency extend it, you put the handle down, you twist it clockwise, and then you pull it out. It takes quite a bit of pressure to pull it out. I think it's like 50 pounds. It's a lot of pressure it takes to pull that out. But the emergency landing gear system, there's a nitrogen bottle, a 3,000 PSI nitrogen bottle. It's in the nose wheel well. Um, and when you pull that handle out, it releases that nitrogen out of that bottle and pressurizes the, uh, the emergency landing gear extension. It's a separate circuit. Uh, it opens the doors there, releases the locks and the gear, gravity falls, um, and then the system uh, also pressurizes the down lock actuators once the gear is in place. But if I remember right from my time in QA and witnessing those drop checks, that's an open system if I remember right. It, um, it vents that hydraulic fluid overboard um, once it uh, does its job. I remember them, you know, putting drip pans underneath that uh, landing gear when they blow it down as part of that drop check and catch all that fluid running out there. So actually, I think that's an open system. But um, but yeah, that's sort of the landing gear, emergency landing gear extension. Um, also, on the vertical console, you have your emergency stores jet. That's one of your jettison modes in the front seat. And when you click on that. Um, it'll jettison all the ordnance that can be jettisoned, which is everything except for the side winders. Um, it'll jettison the tanks and the belly stations and the pylons. Um, stations 1, 2, 7, and 8 are all ejected simultaneously, and then the belly stations are rippled off. Uh, you do not need master arm on for that, um, but it'll jettison everything. But that's emergency stores jet. Here you have your control position indicator for your slats, your flaps. Your landing gear and your and your speed brakes. Um, while we're over, while we're in this view, we'll look over here. You have your hydraulic pressure um, indicator here. This is their flight hydraulic needle. Um, flight system is dr driven by the right engine. It provides hydraulics to all your flight controls, and then your combined hydraulic system from your left engine sort of drives everything else. Um, uh, when everything is all normal, you kind of these needles kind of form one straight line here, and there is a pump that lies in between these two hydraulic systems called the the bi die or the bidirectional pump. That will kick on if uh, one of these two hydraulic systems falls below 2,100 psi. But it's a pump. It's kind of a dual act, a dual directional pump. It has an impeller in each one of these hydraulic systems, and so. If the combined hydraulic system, let's say, drops below 2100 PSI, uh, this pump will kick on, and the impeller on the flight side, being driven by the flight side, drives the impeller in the combined side and powers the combined side. Um, if it's working right, it'll keep the combined side pressure between 2400 and 2600 PSI just being pumped from the pressure on the flight side and vice versa. Uh, so that's what uh, the bi die is. We'll, we'll test that um, as part of the startup. Um, and then down here you have a couple flags. These two are from the emergency flight hydraulic pump. Uh, it's an electrical hydraulic pump that's activated when both the combined and the flight side hydraulic pressure fall below 2100 PSI. Now you kick on the emergency flight hydraulic pump. It's an electrically driven um, hydraulic pump. It's got two modes. It's got uh, low and high. Um, when you have it, when it's running in low, this off flag will flip to an on flag. Uh, let me zoom in closer so you can see it. Uh, yeah. So uh, when it's on low, the off flag will flip to an on flag here. Um, and then it can run in low continually. Um, but there's a lot of limitations when you're using this emergency flight hydraulic pump or the backup mod, um, as we called it. Um, the, when you're in low, the, uh, the movement rate on the uh, horizontal stabs and the rudder, and that's all it powers. Um, remember, that's a, hydraulic, that's a flight hydraulic pump. It's only tied to the flight side system. So 
if you're running on that, you're not going to have wing sweep. You're not going to have flaps or slats or spoilers or um, or brakes. You'll be using your aux brakes. You've got to blow your gear down. It really is a minimal system that's just meant to kind of get you home. Um, and it's not recommended to even try and land on the boat um, when you're running off of that. I think you're probably in a ditching scenario um, if you're running on the, the, the backup mod. Uh, but when you're in low mode, uh, you only get five degree per second movement out of your um, horizontal stabs and, and your rudder in low. Uh, but you can run continually in low. Um, if you're uh, if you flip it to high, you're in high, and that's only good for like eight minutes or so. And it's subject to just thermal um, dynamics of that system. When it eventually burns itself out, well, that's when you're done with it. But um, but you can run it in high for it's supposed to run for eight minutes, and then you get 10 degree per second um, movement rate out of your uh, flight controls in, in high. So so what you're supposed to do is run it in low, uh, get yourself home, and then um, when you do get home and, you, and the pattern, uh, then you flip it to high, you know, for landing. That's kind of how that works. There's a whole section in the NATOPS about, uh, you know, um, uh, how to control the airplane when you're under there's emergency flight hydraulics. Um, you know, you can go into pilot-induced oscillations very easily with those low, you know, control authority rates. You know, normally you have 36 degree per second authority on your flight controls. Well, with only 5 or 10 degree degrees per second authority, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble real quick. Um, so there's a whole treatise in the NATOPS about uh, um, techniques to use when you're uh, running on your backup mod. But but that's the backup mod. We'll test that um, it's part of startup as well. And then you got your spoiler mod here. This will flip from off to on when that outboard um, spoiler mod is turned on to power those the outboard spoilers once your wings are swept forward. Um, so that's that. You've got um, oil pressure indicators, nozzle position indicators, and then your engine indicating group here. Um, reposition. And then up here you got your basic flight instruments, VSI, airspeed, altimeter, and then uh, this is your radar altimeter here. And then you have your fuel shutoff. Pulling this will remove <clears throat> fuel from the um, main engine control, and then behind it is a button to um, blow the uh, fire extinguisher bottle on the left. So that rounds out the left. Now let's look at the... Uh, front center console here consoles um start at the top you have your left and right engine stall lights um, up here and then you have some ladder lights on the left and the right side of the hud uh the left ladder light here this top one is the wheels light that comes on if the landing gear is not down and locked and the flaps are greater than 10 degrees and the throttle is below 85 percent i think that's uh, the three things that'll light that wheels light and then you have a brakes light your brakes light uh will illuminate whenever you're you're um operating when your aux brakes be it the uh the parking brake handle pulled out there or the rudder pedals depressed without combined hydraulic pressure to the brakes and you're using the the aux uh, pedal brakes um it'll light that uh brakes light you have a a caution light for the ACLS autopilot that will come on whenever you uncouple from an ACLS approach. Um, they call that pilot takeover. Um, you can, a couple different things will do that. Um, you can disengage the, uh, the autopilot or control stick pressure above a certain amount will disengage, um, will cause you to uncouple as well. There might be a couple of other things that can do that, but uh, when you've uncoupled from a uh, ACLS approach, the ACLS autopilot light will come on. Below that is nozzle steering engage um, light, and then below that is your auto throttle engaged light. And then over here you have your AOA indexers. That takes care of the left. This is your HUD camera. You know, interesting and interestingly enough, um, our flight crews um, carried a hex wrench to 
get this thing out of the way, they would, these two little holes right here up in there as a little hex head screw, and they would, uh, we had a crews that would carry a wrench and uh, pop this HUD camera out on their own for landing. And, um, you know, it was always a pain in the, in the butt because they'd always kind of forget it and leave it out. We'd have to put it back in. But now I understand why after, you know, flying the, the Tomcat here, I can understand why they want to pop that thing off, you know, for landing. But anyway, that's the HUD camera. Over here on the right-hand side, you have some repeaters from the AOR 67, SAM, AAA, and AI Airborne Intercept. Uh, moving down, we have the AOA indexer. This is the ACM guard. Raising this ACM guard does a couple things. Uh, sets the gun rate to high, turns sidewinder cool on, turns missile prep on. It also inhibits uh, missile launch from the rear seat. The Rio will not get a hot air-to-air -air launch light back there if the ACM guard is up. Um, underneath it, there's an ACM jet push button. That's this, uh, another one of those jettison modes from the front seat. Um, it's different from emergency stores jet in that it will only jettison what the Rio has selected in the back seat on that control indicator panel back there on his left knee. Um, but that's ACM jet. Here you have a couple lights. You have seam lock for the Sidewinder, Sidewinder expanded acquisition mode. And then you have a collision steering um, light here. So there's a couple different steering modes. When you're in air to air, there's a steering T that will um, appear on the HUD. You follow that steering T by putting that steering T in the middle of the aircraft reticle. Um, but uh, um, that steering T will, will be steering you um, depending on your weapon selection and other things. So if you have a, a missile selected, that steering T is actually steering you in uh, lead pursuit. If you don't have a weapon selected, that steering T is steering you in pure pursuit. Um, now the Rio has a push tile on the right side of the TID there, collision push tile, where if he pushes that, this light will come on and that steering T is steering you in uh, collision steering or in a collision course. Uh, and this light will indicate that. So that's what that light's for. The other light here is hot trigger. It shows that uh, you pull the trigger, something's gonna happen. Uh, various things will, or various interlocks are involved in a hot trigger. Um, for uh, air to air, you have to have the nose landing gear. Door needs to be up and locked. You have to have weight off wheels. Uh, for a Phoenix, you have to have an STT or a uh, valid track file. Um, there might be some other things I'm not remembering right now. But uh, when when all those interlocks are all made, um, you'll have a you'll have a hot trigger. Um, master caution. This is your uh, normal boresight mode. If you want to take a boresight uh, sparrow shot, what that does, it switches on the uh, the flood antenna. Just forward of the windscreen here is the uh, continuous wave illumination flood antenna. You know, normally when you're not in boresight, um, your target's being illuminated from the continuous wave antenna that's kind of built into the AUG-9 antenna. If you lose single target track or if you select boresight here, it switches on the, the flood antenna, which puts out a, a, a vertically oriented sort of cone of uh, continuous wave illumination off that antenna in the front there. And you can take a shot or save your shot um, through that flood antenna, but that's what that is. Um, oh, gun rate has low and high, 2,400, no wait, 4,000, 6,000 rounds a minute, I believe it is uh, from the gun rate. Other gun parameters are set um, on the ground on the on the GCU gun control unit. Uh, it's in the panel down there on the on the left above the gun. I think that sets uh, the burst um, rate, the burst interval, burst duration rather um, on the front of there. But the 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 this allows you to choose um, the gun rate: 4,000 rounds a minute or 6,000 rounds a minute. I think those are the two gun rates tied to this. But that's that. And then you have the Sidewinder cool. There's a nitrogen bottle that's in the Sidewinder rail that feeds uh, coolant to the Sidewinder seeker head. It's good for about two hours or so, but uh, this switch turns that on. And as I said, it comes on when the ACM guard is up. And then missile prep 
um, turns on the electronics in the uh, in the sparrows and the phoenix um, missiles um, that uh, initiate the tuning cycle. Those missiles um, tune themselves to the AUG-9 and the continuous wave illumination um, frequency there. There's a circuit called a phase lock loop that uh, tunes itself to those um, to those frequencies and missile prep on turns those missile missile electronics on and starts that tuning cycle um, on those missiles and that's kind of tied to these flags here so these are your weapon station status flags um, they're black if the station's not loaded or not ready they flip white when the station is loaded and ready I think ready for a sidewinder is simply the presence of the sidewinder if I'm not mistaken uh, for the radar missiles, ready means it's tuned uh, to the uh, AUG-9 um, frequencies there, so that's a white flag. Checkerboard means that station is, is uh, selected. It'll be the next one to, to launch when you squeeze the trigger. The belly station flags are a little different logic. I think these go white when the missiles are tuned and the, the rails aren't armed. I think that's what it is, but when you arm the rails... Um, on the deck, the flags will flip to checkerboard uh, just for the belly stations. I think that's that's how those work, if I'm remembering that right. But so a little different logic for those. But these are your weapon station status flags. Um, I think I mentioned master arm. Uh, turn and slip indicator here. And then you have your left and right fire lights. Those are lit by, there's a sensing loop that's run around the engine bay. That's like a thermistor. It's got two... Um, uh, conductors in it and the temperature of that sensing loop will determine the resistance of, of that loop um, and there are certain conditions that will um, uh, cause that resistance to lower to the point where it will light these lights um, it's like any instantaneous temperature in like one spot or um, I think it's like a thousand degrees or something like that in one spot and then it's like a you know several hundred degrees along its length. There's various kind of combinations, kind of a continuum, you know, sort of thing. Um, but uh, that sensing loop and the resistance of that sensing loop um, is what will light or not uh, these fire detection lights. I think there's also a sensing um, loop on the bleed air ducts as well. Um, that bleed air gets above. I think 500 degrees or something like that. Uh, those sensing loops will light the. Uh, well, no, they they don't light the light. I think they cause a bleed duct light to come on on the caution advisory panel. For those, those aren't the fire lights. That's the bleed duct light. Uh, it's only the ones in the engine bay that are the fire lights, if I'm remembering that right. But, uh, but that's those. Uh, and then going down here on the VDI uh, on the left, these are some repeaters off of the data link system. The Rio has that digital data indicator back there, and these are kind of like repeaters off of that. They're based around the ACLS approach. So as you progress along um, the ACLS approach, uh, these lights will sort of light um, in sequence here um, uh, before you couple these lights um, will come on. You get the landing check light, you'll get the ACL um, ready light when the spin 42 um, has sort of locked on to you <clears throat> and then the AP coupler light will come on when it's basically offering to to couple you engage the ACL autopilot the AP reference light comes on you click the nose wheel steering um, switch and then you're coupled and then once you're coupled the command control light comes on to show that you're getting steering commands um, from the data link on the, on the ship um, when you are, are approximately 10 seconds from landing the 10 seconds light comes on when that comes on uh, the data link is is intermingling uh, it's taking into account uh, the motion of the boat in those last 10 10 seconds um, so and when that happens the uh, the 10 second light will come on um, the system needs to receive a command every uh, two seconds I think it is um, and if it fails to receive a command in that two-second period, it lights the tilt light. Um, the voice light will come on when uh, they're basically you're not going to fly a coupled approach. The data link has not uh, um, been set to uh, to couple with you um, prior to that. You, this when the voice light um, comes on, I believe that's that's what that is. Uh, if I'm remembering that correct. 
Uh, but that's those lights. Uh, there's a light here for the um, auto throttle. This is the AP reference light that uh, we've talked about. And then um, you come over here on the right hand side. This is the wave off repeater um, for the for the data link um, if they're sending you a wave off discrete. And then below that you have a wing sweep light. A couple things will uh, light that wing sweep light. Um, I think it's the failure. You know, I talked about the electrical um, wing sweep servo actuator. If those um, channels, you know, have failed, uh, that will light uh, that wing sweep light. And I also I think that will come on if you would disengage that spider detent with that um, emergency wing sweep handle. That will light that uh, wing sweep light as well. Below that is a reduced speed light. Uh, that light will come on when you've exceeded VNE or the never exceed speed for the Tomcat. Um, I think it's uh, this 2.4 Mach number here. Um, you ex exceed that, the uh, reduced speed light will come on. The other thing that lights that light is uh, temperature. The uh, you know there's a temperature probe, uh, a total temperature probe that's uh, sensing the temperature of the uh, of the airstream around the jet. <clears throat> You know, and that'll and that'll increase as you you know go faster, you know, through fric friction forces. And uh, I think when that reaches, I think it's 388 degrees, um, that uh, reduced speed light will come on. That's the other thing that will light that light. Um, so that's what that is. And then your HUD brightness, uh, VDI brightness contrast controls here. Um, let me reposition downwards. This is your HSD, your horizontal situation display. Um, yeah, it takes care of the that. Let me reposition over it this way. This is your PDCP, or your pilot's display control panel over here. This is your hook. Um, hook up and down. You can uh, emergency extend the hook by um, uh, pulling it and turning it. Uh, this is your uh, emergency hook extension. To the right here is the rounds counter. The ordnance guys, after loading the gun, uh, they'll come up here and set the number of rounds uh, in the drum. But uh, that's what that is. This is your PDCP. These are your main display modes of your HUD and your VDI. Uh, these horizontals are your um, steering commands. Uh, this is uh, for the steering information displayed on your indicators. This is the source. Um, of your steering information. Um, your selections here for decluttering the HUD, uh, for choosing what needles you're going to have displayed on the HUD or the VDI. You can choose to have the ICLS needles displayed or the ACL needles displayed uh, for both the VDI and the HUD. Um, I am going to mention that's the declutter. This is your VDI. can be put in TV mode where it will show the uh, lantern or the the TCS on the VDI or in normal you get your attitude display on the VDI. This is your HSD mode switch. The HSD um, can display um, the HSD display or it can display the TID from the back seat, TID repeat. It'll show you what the Rio is looking at on the TID. Uh, this ECM mode is kind of a leftover from, oh they don't even let you switch to it here. Uh, that's just cool. Uh, this ECM is kind of a leftover from pre-ALR 67 when it was the ALR 4550. This was also the display for the ALR 4550, and you'd flip it to ECM to see the ALR 4550 display. This override was if it was in, you know, NAV or or, or TID repeat, and uh, an ALR 50 uh, or 45 or 50 alarm. Um, was coming in, it would automatically switch to the uh, ECM display. That's what the override was for. But that's all kind of um, um, OBE now, and uh, it's just a HSD or TID display. But that's that. Um, below here you have the power for the three indicators. And this is the brightness for the pitch ladders um, on the HUD. And this is the elevation lead control for manual air-to-air um, -air, uh, gunnery. I think it's also for manual air-to-ground um, bombing. It basically uh, positions the uh, pipper um, on the HUD in relation to the ADL um, 
So that's what that is. All right, let me reposition and we'll come down and go through the left console. Um, starting at the top here, spoiler failure override. So the system will detect certain failures in the, in the spoiler system, certain things that will declare to be failures. Um, one of those is the, uh, the, if the spoilers are greater than 18 degrees, it will declare that to be a failure and it will drop the failed spoiler as well as the spoiler on the other side. And I think it drops them into the droop position, which is uh, four and a half degrees down, I think it is. Um, so that's a declared failure. Um, the other declared failure is a mismatch between the lateral deflection of the stick and the spoiler. So, for example, if your right spoilers are up, but you are deflecting the stick more than an inch to the left, it declares that to be a failure, and it will drop the failed spoiler as well as the spoiler on the other side. Um, but these allow you to override that. That's what these are for, is to override that forcing down of the, uh, of the spoilers. Um, so that's what that is. And then you have the caution advisory panel. After that, you have the generator controls. Um, you know, we don't have to mess with these too much. You keep them in normal, and the um, you know generators will kick on and tie themselves to the bus. Uh, if you need to reset that, uh, you can put these back into off or reset and attempt to um, reset your generators. Um, the airplane has two generators. It has an uh, engine-driven generator on the right engine and the left engine. They supply 115 volts AC, three phase, 400 hertz um, power. And then there's also transformer rectifiers that will, in addition to the AC, convert that to DC and provide 28 volts DC to various systems. Um, but that's those. And then you, you also have a third generator, an emergency generator, which is a hydraulically driven generator. I think it's driven from the combined hydraulic system. Um, so if you lose those two, you've got uh, that third um, emergency generator there. So that's your generator control. Uh, here you have your um, ECS. Um, you got a temperature rheostat to change the temperature, or you can put it in auto. I can't remember what temperature it maintains in auto, but, uh, but that's the temperature control. Cabin pressure, dump valve to um, dump cabin pressure. I think the airplane will hold an 8,000 foot cabin up to 23,000 feet, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So you don't really need to, the crew needs to have their oxygen mask for takeoff on, for takeoff and landing as part of that checklist. But you're going to take your oxygen mask off and leave it off up to 23,000 feet, I think it was. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's the cabin pressure dump valve. Um, your air source left, right both engine are off, and then you have ram air, and you can in increase or decrease that uh, ram air um, with this here. So that's that, and then behind that we have um, a couple switches. You have a windshield uh, air. There's a, a nozzle, an air nozzle, just forward of the windscreen there that you can hit that on, and it, it's high pressure air that kind of comes out of there and blows. Um, rain off of the uh, the windshield. That's what that's for. Over here is the engine probe, anti-ice. If I'm remembering right, I think this is that older A model. Later on, uh, it actually showed um, uh, ramp anti-ice as well um, on here. But uh, but this engages the um, anti-ice for the uh, anti-ice on the engine probes. Um, and for the ramps, I think what it did was, if you look at the ramps, there's like three ramps. Uh, ramps one and two are the forward two ramps, and then ramp the third ramp is the, uh, the aft ramp. And that third ramp is the one that has its lip facing forward, and that's the one that would like pick up ice under icing conditions. And so for the uh, ramp anti-ice, I think what it did is it positioned ramps one and two uh, always to be lower than ramp number three. And what that did was kind of removed the airflow um, from the third ramp there as a measure uh, to um, combat icing, uh, if I'm remembering how that worked right. Uh, but that's that's what that 
switch is four. Um, let's jump up and out here to the compass control panel. Um, so the compass system uh, is called AHARS, Automatic Heading Reference System, and the compass system combined kind of uh, create that system. There's a magnetic azimuth detector that's uh, in the left, I think it is, vertical stab back there that actually does the, uh, you know, magnetic field sensing. Um, and that system is what drives the, the compass card. I didn't talk about the compass card. So uh, over here, you have your backup ADI. You got repeaters for the front and rear seat UHF. You have your indicator for the ALR67. But then you got your BDHI over here. Um, the BDHI has a tack-in needle. That's the one spinning now. It's got an ADF needle. It's got a drum on the inside for your... DME, your distance from your tack end station, and along the outside you have uh, the compass card here. And that compass card is driven uh, by the AHARS. So let me jump back to the console. Um, so this is the, uh, the uh, compass control panel. It's got a couple of different modes it operates in. One is slaved. So slaved um, kind of drives the compass card via through the AHARS um, gyro and up to the to the BDHI here, so it's kind of it's kind of like it stabilizes the the compass card, um, and that's the sort of the slaved mode. But then you can put it in compass mode, and what that is is a direct drive from that magnetic azimuth detector um, to the compass card in the BDHI. It'll act a bit wonky um, when it's not being, uh, you know, sort of stabilized through that AHARS gyro, but but that's what that is. And then it's got DG mode um, over here, and DG mode is good old-fashioned directional gyro like you might have in a Cessna 172, and um, you have to uh, kind of keep an eye on this compass card and keep it slave to the wet compass. It'll drift over time. Uh, but that's what uh, the DG mode is. Uh, this indicator here indicates the state of the um, the uh, the slaving of the uh, of the compass. Uh, uh, it can, if it's laying over to the left or to the right, uh, the the compass card is not really um, slaved accurately to that um, magnetic azimuth detector there to the AHARS gyro. Um, when you're on the boat, you'll notice your magnetic um, indications could be uh, pretty far off, 10 or 20 degrees off. Heepler actually modeled that um, in the Tomcat. When you're on that big piece of steel there, uh, the carrier, your compass is not going to be accurate, um, and it's not going to be slaved. And so this needle will be laying over to the left or to the right. After you get in the air and um, some duration of straight and level flight, the compass card will slave itself and... Um, set itself straight uh, and the needle will center it can take a few minutes for that needle to center uh, you can uh, push the button here when you push this you enter a fast direct mode um, and it'll speed that up but um, but that's uh, kind of what this is indicating is the slave status of the uh, of the compass um, and then if you need to kind of slave it manually like if you're in DG mode you push this and rotate it and that's a way of slaving the compass card to the wet compass. Um, so that's kind of how that works. And AHARS is also your backup attitude gyro. If the IMU has failed, um, the AHARS is your backup gyro. It's not a full 360 gyro. It will tumble when you hit, I think it's 85 degrees, um, pitcher bank or something like that, but it's the backup gyro as well. So that's that. Out here you have a, a thing where you can set the uh, latitude or, or, or longitude. Um, it's part of the uh, you know the compass slaving system. It needs to know what its degrees uh, north or south latitude um, is. So that's what that's what that is over there. Um, after that, you have the ICLS. A pretty simple system. Uh, you turn the power on. Uh, choose your channel. Uh, there is a bit. If you want to run that, you have to be in the proper display mode. Uh, go to landing mode. AWL PCD have ILS displays on your VDI and or your HUD and you press this bit button 
and the uh, ICLS needles will come up and the, uh, the lateral deviation needle, the vertical one, will sweep left and right uh, across the indicator there. So that's a bit test of that system. Uh, aft of here, we have the master lights control panel. Nothing special to mention there. You also have your hook bypass uh, field and carrier there as well. Um, but these are all your various light rheostats. Um, after this, you have your master test panel for running various um, tests. Uh, some of them are just user evaluated, like the lights test. <clears throat> some of them are um, will give you a go indication on the, the master test panel. Um, so that's that. Uh, this is your that emergency flight hydraulic pump, that backup mod I was talking about. Uh, you flip the guard, you can, um, in auto, it will come on when the combined and flight hydraulics are both below 2100 PSI. You can put it manually to low or high. Um, these look like leftovers from old, old F-14A videotape recorder controls that, uh, you know, went by the wayside. So um, these are just kind of there for aesthetics. These aren't going to be um, functional. I mean, you know, that's all built into the sensor control panel back there in the rear seat now. But so you can probably ignore those. This is your um, hydraulic transfer pump that uh, Bidai I was talking about. Um, it's got normal position where it will come on if one of the two hydraulic systems is below. 2100 PSI um, or off where you can uh, force it to be off. Um, so that's that. Uh, the only other thing on the right console we're talking about is the canopy handle. Uh, there's a handle here you can't really see because it, it, it flips up, but you, you kind of pull it and you flip it out and then you can pull it, uh, you know, forward and aft to operate the canopy. Uh, canopy bottle is in the nose wheel well, 3000 PSI nitrogen bottle. That charge is good for, I think, uh, up to 10 cycles of the canopy, and then the troubleshooters have to refill it. But you, you pull the handle out, and you push it forward to close or aft to open. And then once the canopy is open or closed, you return it to hold um, so you don't bleed the bottle unnecessarily. But then you also have a boost mode. I think it just uh, provides some more pressure to the canopy. You use that under high wind um, you know, conditions is boost. And then there's an emergency open. Let's, if the main bottle in the nose wheel well is drained out uh, to get the canopy open, you can pull it all the way back to um, emergency open. And there's an emergency canopy bottle, which is up on top uh, just after the canopy um, is the emergency bottle. And it will use that one to, to get the canopy open. Uh, so that's what that is. Um, is anything else I didn't talk about? I don't remember mentioning the VSI, but there's the VSI and there's your clock. Uh, talk about the fuel quantity indicator. Um, I don't think I mentioned that total. There's, so there, there's the total fuel quantity, the quantity of all of your tanks and uh, fuselage, feed group, wing tank, externals, all that adds up. And that's your, that's your fuel quantity. I think, as I mentioned, the vent tank is not metered uh, that's, that's not part of that but that's your fuel quantity and there's your bingo and a knob to change the fuel bingo and i think i mentioned everything i'm just trying to think of anything i didn't mention i don't remember mentioning this night filter handle yeah you pull that out and engages the night filter on the hud it's just like a red piece of plastic um that comes out and covers over the uh the hud um uh, display um there on the top of the of the VDI um, so that's what that is you click on the the VDI um, and it engages the night filter they don't have the 3d night filter model there was a night filter for the VDI that the air that was kept in the in the storage box there on the back right um, and that basically fit into here um, the night filter had a little handle on it and it's kind of snapped into here uh, but that was the uh, VDI night, night filter, red piece of plastic. And then there was also a red piece of plastic that snapped onto the front of the HSD uh, for the night filter um, on the HSD. I think Keepler said eventually they'll have 3D models in here for those filters, but right now um, they don't. Um, 
I think I've covered everything in the front seat now. So what we'll do next is I'll go through a, uh, a startup. I'll, I'll do a, you know, just kind of a slow walkthrough of one um, and then uh, start it up. And then what I'll do, I think, uh, I think it'd be cool to do. I've got a video off the uh, interwebs there of a real world startup. And I'll try and do one like in real time following that uh video to kind of round things out that should be uh kind of fun but uh we'll do that next i think that completes our walk around all right we're in the jet we got power on uh, a couple of the things right off the bat that you want to check in the real world is that your wing sweep position matches your emergency wing sweep handle don't want anything nasty happening when we get hydraulics on uh, the auxiliary brake accumulator should be in the green this has been reported, uh, our virtual plane captain in the, in the Tomcat module is not uh, pumping up our aux brakes like he should be. Um, the other thing it's not in the normal place that it would be as an initial switch position is the hydraulic transfer pump, the bi die. Um, that's normally in shutoff as a uh, initial position. I'm not going to put it in shutoff because it's almost impossible to get the track IR angle to um, flip that switch, so I'm not going to do it. I'll describe its operation, um, but I'm not going to do it. The emergency flight hydraulics can be tough too, but uh, I'll deal with that. Uh, so that's that, and then we'll do our pre-start check, starting with the lights test. Verify that all the lights are working. A uh, real key one here is the emergency storage jet. Uh, if that bulb is burned out but the button's pushed you'll have a bad day when you get weight off wheels uh, we'll check that do the fire detection test good left and right fire lights good go light on the master test panel and then we'll do the instrument test uh, it's going to drive our tapes the AOA is going to drive to 18 and a half units the wing sweep indicator is going to drive to 45 degrees RPM is 96 percent TIT is 960 degrees. Fuel flow is 10,500. Uh, the fuel quantity is 2,000. Um, because of the TIT, we have left and right stall lights. And because of the fuel quantity, we've got left and right fuel low. And then uh, it's not modeled yet, but uh, I think they're going to have the locks gauge. The locks, I think the locks gauge is mounted over here. Um, but that would be driven to two liters of liquid oxygen. And that's a good instrument test. And then we'll go off on that. Um, and then we're ready to go ahead and call for um, air and close the canopy. Let me freeze my headset. Call for the air. Chief, connect ground air supply. And then we'll arm our seats. Copy. And the Rio... Ground air supply is now connected. We'll close the canopy. And then we're ready to go ahead and um, start the engine. So let me freeze my headset down here. Um, we're going to go ahead and start by cranking the left. And the troubleshooter is over there on the yep. left side. He's going to bleed the hydraulics. It's going to signal the plane captain when he's got... Um, Good uh, hydraulic bleed done, and then uh, we'll center that. And then he's going to run over to the right. All right, ready to start. He's going to bleed the hydraulics over there. And then uh, he's bleeding hydraulics. He's pushing a button. He's uh, getting all the air to kind of spit out of it. And when he's got a good hydraulic stream, uh, I'll give the signal there. Um, that's a good bleed over there. And then uh, we're going to check our emergency flight hydraulic pump, our backup mod. We're going to go to low. We're going to verify controlled movement at that 5 degree per second right there. And then we're going to go to high. We're going to uh, check for our flags as well. I didn't mention that on the low, but on the high, we're going to check for our flag. We're going to verify that... Um, Control surface movement, 10 degrees per second in high there. 
and then we're going to shut that off. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, crank our engine, or start our engine rather. So, crank switch to the right. We're looking for 20% RPM. Come around the horn. We're monitoring our RPM and our turbine inlet temperature. We're going to make sure our TIT doesn't go above 890. That's the limit. Um, our caution lights have gone out on our right side. Uh, generators kicked on. At this point, we can get the PC the signal to um, pull the power. Chief, turn off the ground power. And we'll look for our engine to stabilize. 70%, 500 degrees TIT, 1,000 pounds per hour fuel flow, and uh, 25 to 35 nominal on the uh, oil pressure. So that's a good start on the right. Now we'll move to the left. And we'll test our um, by die. So we center the left. You let it get to 3,000 PSI, and then you center it. Uh, the hydraulic gauge is a little funky. You see it's climbing even now with it off. But um, you let it get to 3,000, which it should do pretty quickly, and then you cut it off. Um, and then you put the, uh, the bide eye to normal. You look to see that the bide eye is going to, um, once the uh, pressure falls below 2,100 here, it kicks on. And then the bite eye within 10 seconds should bring the combined side up to between 24 and 2600 psi. If it doesn't do it within 10 seconds, um, that's a failed test, and you want to shut it off so it doesn't burn itself up. Um, but then uh, once that checks good, you go back to shut off on it, and then you, uh, you come back and you finish the uh, engine start. So we'll crank the left. Twenty percent RPM around the horn. Monitoring the TIT, looking for our lights to go out. Go. Left generator kicks on. Crank switch centers. We can uh, tell the plane captain he can pull the air. All right, so now we've got um, two good engines. We're going to um, get our air source on. We're going to cycle it through left, right, and then both. And then we're going to um, uh, put our by die back to normal. We're going to turn our stab aug on here. And then we're going to run our emergency generator check. not modeled um, yet, but emergency generator check. You'll get a power transient, um, which is normal. You'll get a go light on the master test panel. You can expect some caution advisories from the um, from the AFCS, which you can clear um, with a master reset. Um, but then that takes care of the uh, emergency generator checks. And when that's done, uh, you can go ahead and turn on most of your other electronics here. You can uh, turn the displays on, and then we're going to move to the uh, the uh, secondary engine mode test. So we're going to go to secondary mode on the left engine. You got a secondary caution light come up. Um, it's not completely modeled yet. Uh, when you go to secondary, the nozzles will close, and the nozzle indicator basically becomes an operative and kind of lays down below zero. The nozzles are scheduled by the AFTC, which is why. Um, they open in secondary mode, but then you'll bump the throttle, just verify you got the uh, throttle response, and then you go back to primary, secondary, do the same thing on the right. Here's a secondary light, the no nozzles will close, indicator will lay over there, 
bump the nozzles, I mean, it bump the throttles, verify you got throttle response, and then you can go back to primary. Um, so that takes care of the engine checks. And then the next thing you do by the checklist, uh, if the wings aren't oversweep, now's the time um, you put them in oversweep and you uh, put the, uh, the hat switch on the throttle there um, to auto. So that's what you do now and you go around the horn. You basically turn everything on. It's going to be tested during OBC, um, TACAN, the UHF. You go to off on the wing external transfer. You make sure your trim is set to zero. You uh, turn your rat out on. You uncage your standby attitude indicator. You turn the ICLS on. Um, and then you're ready to go ahead and run OBC. And then you put the uh, uh, master test into OBC and you engage the autopilot um, for OBC. And then you go ahead and you uh, let OBC run. Um, and a bunch of stuff is going to get checked um, for OBC. Um, it's going to check the, um, the, uh, the flight control system. It's going to check the, uh, the trim system. It's going to check that pitch parallel actuator. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it's important to make sure that trim is set to zero before you run OBC. Um, uh, you don't want the stick to hit the, hit the stop uh, and then um, uh, break that uh, force link in that pitch parallel actuator. Uh, but that's going to get tested. Um, it's going to test the, uh, the rudder. It's going to test the rudder pedal shaker. The Tomcat has a rudder pedal shaker um, that engages and shakes the rudder pedals uh, over, I think it's 20 units of AOA. Um, it's going to check that. Um, it's going to check the ramps, the AICS. It's going to um, drive the ramps uh, through their range. Um, and so the plane captain um, uh, is going to come out to the front of the plane and flash you the T signal, uh, which is him expecting you to be running OBC. So uh, we initiate OBC, and that's going to run. Then once the plane captain sees the ramps start to run, that's um, his signal there from the outside that OBC has started and then he'll um, press on with the rest of the of the checks. He's going to have us uh, extend the uh, refueling probe. Check that it went from off to auto there when you went to um, uh, extend all. Got a good refueling probe. I'm going to extend the speed brakes. They're going to go back there and um, make sure that there's no hydraulic leaks, no hardware issues, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and then it'll have us put the speed brakes back in. And then it'll have us put the probe back in. And then we're going to cycle the windshield air. Uh, just go from off to air. Um, it wasn't off. It was That's off. That's air. Um, there really isn't much to see during the windshield air test. If you actually look up, um, you usually see some dust blowing off the uh, the front of the plane there or, or whatever. You see that puff of air come out there, but that's 390 degree air shooting out of that um, vent in front of the windscreen there. But um, uh, oops, you cycle that. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but the rain repel was never implemented um, in the Tomcat, so the the rain repel actually. Um, has no function there, but um, you cycle that, and then you kind of wait for OBC to um, complete. And right about this time, it should be uh, um, wrapping up. Um, so then you go ahead and uh, rotate OBC to off. Um, as part of the OBC checks, it actually tests the autopilot disengage, so the autopilot would be disengaged um, at the end of uh, OBC. But so I'll just flick it off now. Um, and then you run the trim checks. Um, you run the trim throughout its complete range. So I'll go ahead and um, just do that. I, I won't do it all because um, no sense in just sitting here and watching it. But you run it um, through the full range all the way um, nose up. 
and then through the full range, nose down, and then left and right. Left, right, looks like I'm not going to run it all the way through. It will not be too boring. All right, and so then that's the trim checks complete. And then it's time to um, spread the wings. So we're going to bring uh, the wings out to 68. We're going to put the handle down. We're going to hit master reset and the wings in auto and the wings are going to sweep out and then we're going to put the flaps down and then we're going to cycle the stick here we have verify a good indicators good movement we're going to cycle the rudders and then we're going to um, tested spoilers we're going to engage DLC there we have verify we have good spoilers disengage the DLC we're going to check the spoiler break at that verify the spoilers go down with ah, ready to taxi. throttle movement and then we turn that off and then we raise the flaps and then we lower the flaps with the, the maneuvering flaps with the DLC thumb wheel. And then we manually drive the wings back to 50. And then we crack them up a little bit with that maneuvering thumb wheel. And then we go to bomb. And they'll be automatically retracted. And the wings go to 55. And then we drive them the rest of the way aft. And then we put them in over sweep. We raise the handle. We're going to wait for that horizontal tail authority light to go off. And then we're going to put them in over sweep. All right. And then the next thing the plane captain uh, will take us through is doing the anti skid bit test. So we're going to put the parking brake off. We're going to put um, spoiler brake anti-skid to both, and we're going to hold the brakes. And the plane captain's helper is going to go up under the nose wheel well there and run the anti-skid bit test. He's going to get good bit flags on the bit box. We're going to feel the brakes release. And then that's a good test of the uh, anti-skid. And we turn that off. And now it's time for... Um, to kneel the plane and drop the tail hook and they're going to inspect the tail hook when we drop the tail hook we're looking for um, the rats uh, indication there rats is a system that derates the f-110s with the hook down and, and derates mill power the stated purpose of that in the NATOPS is to um, model the mill thrust of the uh, of the TF-30. Um, but uh, but that's what rats is. Um, and you're going to you're going to get a rats light when the when the hook is down. We have a launch bar light because we're in Neil and the launch bar um, is down. If we went to mill that launch bar light would go out. We're not going to down the flight line. But um, so then we'll raise the hook. I'll give it a shove and uh, verify that um, the centering spring is working. We're going to do a launch bar abort test. Verify that launch bar abort is working. And then we're going to bring it out of kneel. And, uh, and that's it. We're going to, when the Rio is ready to go, we'll signal the plane captain that we're um, ready to go. We'll release the brakes. Nose wheel steering and on. And uh, we'll taxi us away. So that is on the way out. We'll bump the brakes. Verify that's good. Test the nose wheel steering. On the way out. Verify that's good. And then um, we're on our way.
All right, so now we'll go ahead and do a uh, real-time uh, startup against that uh, video I found on the internet there. Uh, now the video doesn't start until um, they're bleeding the right side, so um, I'll start it then. But it should be fun. Let's uh, let's get started. Bleed the left. Roger. over to the right and then we'll be the right ready to start Get the sign there test our backup mod on flag low On flag high. Good start. And we'll start the right. They do a crossblade start here too, so that should be cool. Lights, good switch, good temps, pull the power. Chief, turn on the ground power. Oops, pull the power. Chief, turn off the ground power. And the air. Chief, disconnect ground air supply. Getting the huffer out of the way. Crank the left. Stop the left. Normal. 24 to 26. Shut off. Continue the left. Now we're doing a cross blade, so I'm going to come off the throttle stop. I don't want to close the nozzles. You don't want to close the nozzles on the flight line if you can avoid it. So just off the idle stop. Good start. You can pull the ground locks and air source to both. Shut that off. Stab hog on. Emergency generator checks. Get a go light. A little bit of flicker, master reset, it's a good test there, off, time to turn the displays on and run our engine secondary checks, good light, good throttle, good light, good throttle, Check over sweep, hit auto, come around the horn. It's good, good, good trim. That's good. Wreck that on OBC. All right, Jester, good for OBC. They all 
power it on for OBC. Brakes. He's wrapped up. Autopilot would have disengaged during OBC, but that's all right. And then trim checks. Kind of boring, but all right, good trim checks. I'm going to cycle the air. All right, and it's time to spread the wings. Flaps. Could wipe out. Rudders. Spoilers. DLC. Spoiler brake. Flaps. Maneuver flaps. Wings to 50. Crack them. Bomb. Skid, hold the brakes. Good bit. Brakes back on. And then we go to kneel. Launch bar light. Bar abort. Drop the hook. Good rats. Raise the hook. Give it a shove. Come out and kneel. Break off. Time to go, Jester. My God. 
as well staring. Bump the brakes. Test the nose while staring. And then we're off. All right, so that went well. All right, well, there you go. Uh, this was a fun video to make, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.